Hello and welcome to jasonnewland.com, the grooviest website in Colchester. The, um, my name is Jason Newland. Please only listen to this when you can safely close your eyes. And what is this? Well, this is Let Me Bore You to Sleep. It is me sitting in my big black squeaky chair talking and boring you to sleep. So, I hope that you're all well, and uh, as I said, my website, I've been working on it, I do, you know, to try and do a little bit each day to improve it, and there's now testimonials on there, so if you would like to write a testimonial, uh, just write, you know, write something about uh, how you've benefited from listening to me or if you like what I do uh, then please go there and you can do that um, and then I will publish it onto the website for others to look at uh, I've got a testimonial box that comes on it's on the right hand side if you if you're looking at it on a laptop or a, a tablet, there's a, a display, I don't know, what do they call it, carousel or whatever, where different testimonials come up one by, you know, one after another. What else have I got? I've also added tags to the website. So I've already got categories things are in categories and the categories are basically the podcasts but the tags I've put on to try and make it a little bit easier to find what people are looking for so if someone's looking for nail biting a nail biting recording um, they can find it there so there's a cloud a tag cloud at the top of the website as well as also being on the right hand side so if someone wants smoking or um, safety or you know if that's something that people are looking for our gratitude you know as an example they can click on that I will be adding more tags and tagging more stuff but at the moment I've just stuck to the you know the the basic self development ones um i've not put tags for relaxation because there's so many i've got hundreds of relaxation recordings i've not put tags for chronic pain because i've got lots of chronic pain recordings and i've not put tags for sleep or insomnia because again i've got hundreds and hundreds of recordings for that so that that's more category situation um, but everyone everything is organized quite well I think but I will be adding a site map and I will be I'll add, I'm going to add a more like different ways to search for stuff so that it whatever's just find it's finding whatever's easiest or more suitable for you personally and so yeah so I'm, every day if I were to I'm trying to add a little bit I'm going on uh, and studying how to use WordPress and finding out what the best plugins are to improve the website experience for you so that's what I'm doing there and I hope that it's useful um, I'm not sure about the colour of the website 
I might change it. So maybe you can give me a little bit of feedback. Uh, just use the contact form maybe and just let me know. I didn't want to do a whole special form just to ask you if you like the colour. But uh, the website, as far as I'm concerned now, I'm never ever going to change the website. Uh, in a sense of rebuilding a new website from scratch for jasonnewland.com I'll be adding to it I may change the design I may, you know, add bits and change bits but I'm not I don't intend to take any of the pages off so any pages that are indexed on Google and other search engines that people don't use will be uh, you know usable there will be live links because in the past I've just I've had so many different versions of that website and then the link becomes dead once I change to another host so I'm planning to stay where it is and I will be hopefully not yet and it might not be till the end of the year I plan to build rebuild the other websites that I had so the letmeboreyoutosleep.com and deepsleepwhisper.com and all those ones but I have to wait for a few months to find out if I can financially afford to do it so I'm keeping everything kind of as simple as possible yet putting in the effort and the work to make this one website as good as I can so I hope that make, makes sense and uh, so if you want to visit and have a little look and see all the grooviness so what I thought I'm just going to get my pen I've got this book this is one of my let me bore you to sleep library uh, I've got five books so far and I'm probably going to get another one during the next week. I'm actually thinking about buying the Guinness Book of World Records for 2020. The thing is, because I do want to use it for this, you know, for these podcasts at the same time it looks like it's quite a good present to give myself for Christmas and I would like to start buying some presents for myself and wrapping them up so that on Christmas day I can open presents up because otherwise I won't have anything I won't have any presents to unwrap and I actually did that the first Christmas I had Andre I think it was I wrapped up loads of presents there was stuff for me and there was stuff for him uh, just like treats there was cans of coke for me maybe some cans of lager uh, some sweets like a Mar <laughs> like Mars bar and stuff and maybe some books and with Andre I got him some toys and stuff like that so but I've not bothered the last couple of years just haven't, haven't put any effort into it so I think this year I'm going to and also I think this year I'm going to put up Christmas decorations because I've never done it before as far as I remember not not here I 
don't I might have put Christmas decorations up in one place once that I lived when I was 17 I might have done but other than that I've never you know it's a long time ago what was that 17 yeah it's over it's over 16 years isn't it so I thought that would be nice to do that and get a Christmas tree and start to start to try and I'm trying to get in touch with more gratitude and appreciation of what I do have so you know I've got my own home yeah, it's it's rented it's council but it's a home for life and it took me a long long time to get this and I've had it for four be five years in April believe it it's like wow five, five years in what's it now September October November December January February March April so in seven months time I'll have been here for five years and this month I've had Andre for four years he's lived here for four years it was in September four years ago that that little baby first moved into my home and took over and now he's in the bedroom with his girlfriend so it's really oh, the good thing I mentioned I probably mentioned about the fleas we had I had a bit of an infestation of fleas a few weeks ago well they're all gone I managed to get rid of all of them so that's nice but I couldn't believe the effort it took I, it cost me a few quite a few pound as well so at least I now know what I need to do to get rid of them it's just like, wow what a kerfuffle to, to do it all but it's nice it's nice now because especially with the winter coming up I know that the fleas aren't necessarily outside but with the central heating on they'd be nice and cosy here I was even considering like getting the carpet up and just getting rid of the carpet if the the uh, those thingies didn't work that I used but they did so I'm going to read this is basically uh, a book of useless information and I've read out of it before it's over 300 pages and what I do is I mark off the little mark next to the, the thing that I mentioned so that I don't mention it again so I'm just going to have a little drink Mm. Ah, so these this is quite interesting this this seems to be inventions so I thought I'll just open up at a random page James Dyson built 5,127 prototypes 
while developing his vacuum cleaner. It seemed more interesting before I said it out loud. Yeah. Oh, look at this. The first multi-purpose food processor was invented in 1950 by Ken Wood. Ah. What's this here? Although the American Wright brothers were the first people to uh, fly a plane, wealthy British astrocarat Sir George Cayley is described by aviation experts as the father of aeronautics. It says here that he designed his first aircraft as long ago as 1799. And by the middle of the 19th century, he was building and flying gliders. But wasn't, um, what's his name? Not Van Gogh. Leonardo. Leonardo DiCaprio. He, he invented, or he had sketches and stuff of a plane, didn't he? Pretty much. It reminds me. I don't know if anyone listening to this. I don't know if anyone is listening to this, but if there is anyone listening to this, there was. There's a man called Michael Crawford. And he's very famous in the UK of England. And I'm just going to cross off the things that I've read. I've read it that one, read it that one, and I read it that one. I quite like Jason. No, Jason is a nice name. I like James Dyson's. You know those heaters that you have in the in the box? No, in the sorry the <laughs> in the toilets, the public toilets, lavatories. Um the crapper. They they have uh, these not everywhere, I mean most public toilets they you, you know what I mean I, I think a lot of the reasons why uh, maybe people perhaps don't wash their hands after going to the toilet in public toilets is because they just want to get out of there as quickly as possible There's some of the, I think, train stations seem to have them where they, maybe supermarkets as well, have the Dyson dryers and you put your hand in between two, two blowy things and... I quite like it. If I'm honest, I like it. I do. I'd 
quite like to have that for when I got out of the bath. To be able to just sort of step sideways or just step into like a a, thun, a funnel or something that was like the Dyson hand dryer and it just dried my body and my hair and my naughty bits. I think it would be quite nice. The only thing that I don't enjoy as much about the Dyson hand dryer in the public toilets is seeing the g-force on my hands and seeing the skin just wrinkling around it makes me sometimes wonder if I'm aging but of course I'm clearly not because I look as young as I did when I was five but just that wrinkly it reminds me a little bit of James Bond when he was in that uh, G-force machine that they test for you know, S astronauts, astronauts, um, and it just spins round really quickly, and the baddie sneaked in there, and he like, oh, he had to look for a little bit because it was going around quite quickly, so I guess he didn't really get a good look of Mister Bond's face, and. I suppose, you know, he had to kind of have a picture so he could make sure it connected with it. And imagine if he'd have took the wrong picture and it had been Sean Connery. But yeah, anyway, he and he had him turn around really quickly and he turned the, he touched the knob and he turned the knob so that it, um, went round at a more substantial speed and, and went round and the g-force was making James Bond's face go like that very much like my hand whence it was in between the Dyson dryers after having washed my hands it's almost an incentive to wash my hands to then be able to dry them in such a futuristic manner course I don't always use soap but who does no I'm joking I don't wash my hands so what's next oh yeah so there was a film called Condor Man Condor Man and Again, Andre's decided to run around and see what, how many different sounds he can make. It's a little bit like, I forget what they were called, in the 90s, probably early, middle 90s, there was a really popular group of people that they did drumming but they used all kinds of day to day items like a upturned bin and a crate and 
a ceramic elephant, I don't know, whatever they had. And I can't remember what they called themselves, but they travelled the world. They were very popular. And, and it was drumming. And I forget the name of them. But Andre's a bit like that. Except he doesn't do drumming and he doesn't tour the world. He's quite popular. But he try he, it's as if he's making as many different sounds as he can. But he makes them individually, so I guess it doesn't really work as it could do. Unless of course I recorded it, because I could record it and make it into a song but it's as if he's walking around the flat thinking oh if I pulled the kitchen cupboard open and just let it bang that would be another wonderful sound that I can one day use on my album maybe Oh, look at this. So this this is going on about inventions, really. Oh, Condor Man. So what he did is, it was um, Frank Spencer from Some Mothers Do Avum, which was a really famous documentary in the 70s. And he's on a TV show. He was on a film called Condor Man. And he was a superhero. And he had these wings. Um, that they weren't... He didn't actually have wings. But the, it was like a winged suit. And he... He used it to fly... That's pretty much the whole story. Um, I didn't realise it was going to be as boring as that. But I think I don't feel that I've really done the film much justice. Because it was a good film. Or I liked it. And... Really, that that's all that ever really matters, isn't it? Not not just me, but I mean, you know, personally, if you like something, then you like it. So according to this, the policeman's whistle was invented by Birmingham toolmaker by the way this is British useless information so um, the policeman's whistle was invented by Birmingham toolmaker Thomas Hudson in 1883 Hmm. It came um, in response to an advert from the Metro Metropolitan. That's an ice cream, isn't it? The Metropolitan Police, who were looking for a more effective. I need to read ahead before I read this stuff. 
and I do apologise I'm trying to Policeman's whistle was invented by Birmingham toolmaker Thomas Hudson in one eight eight three. It came in response to an advert from the Metropolitan Police. <sighs> who were looking for a more effective <laughs> they're looking for a more effective replacement for the rattle. <laughs> which, was, which was then in use for communication. which was then in use for communication. Hudson's police whistle could be used hands free. <laughs> Basically, that was the first hand, <laughs> the hands-free set that we had. Um, basically, a little—I guess it was a wooden whistle. They probably didn't have plast, uh, metal whistles back then. A Hudson's police whistle could be used hands-free, and the, s <laughs> the sound carried for over a mile. The first order from the police was 21,000. So let's dissect that one. A rattle is what a baby uses, isn't it? You know, and it rattles round or, you know. <laughs> and that's what the police were walking around with before. And I guess from what they're saying is the reason they wanted to replace it with the whistle is because the rattle wasn't hands free. So you needed at least one hand to rattle it. <laughs> and also the rattle couldn't be <laughs> couldn't be heard for very, very far away. Imagine being there and you're a policeman and you've got some emergency situation and and you're standing there and you're rattling, you're rattling your rattle, but no one's coming to your aid, can't get anyone's attention. 
because people just can't hear it because it's too far away. you know it's, the sound just doesn't travel wish I had a whistle maybe that's what it was maybe one day someone you know a policeman was maybe someone tripped over a squirrel you know squirrels getting everywhere and uh, or maybe the squirrel robbed a bank so the policeman grabbed hold of the squirrel grabbed his nuts and uh, put them on the floor and then grabbed his hands and tried to hold on to him but squirrels they're they're very slippery you know it's very hard to wrestle a squirrel and um, maybe this police person was rattling his, his rattle And, you know, the first thing is, oh, I wish I had both hands to hold this squirrel down. But I have to use one hand for the rattle. But then the rattle wasn't working. I wish it was hands-free, but it doesn't work. And then what he does is he whistles with his mouth, like, I'm not going to do a whistle now, but and it managed to manage to get the attention of somebody, and they came over and they helped him. They held his rattle while he um, did what he needed to do, you know, to read the the rights to the squirrel, and you know, waited for the. I don't know the squirrel van to come and get him or whatever process it was and perhaps he was in the canteen not the squirrel but the, the police person I say police person but it was a policeman back then 1883 it was only men that did the job but you know I don't want to you know that's just the way it was in those days but hey they use rattles. So they, you know, they're hardly sophisticated, were they? And but how do they come around having a rattle? Did a policeman go out one day and he was playing with his kid before going and his his wife said Bobby you need to get to work and he said okay Sandra or in those days it's probably husband you need to get to work okay wife or okay mother daddy you need to get to work okay mother I don't know it, it who knows what they said they might have had nicknames for each other Willie and Billy who knows you don't know do you so he goes to work doesn't realise he's got his child's rattle in his pocket and then he apprehends somebody and he's struggling with them and he's thinking oh I wish I could get the attention because he could see his colleague up the road eating a donut but he couldn't quite get to him he couldn't he shouted he said oi Steve but Steve couldn't hear him and he was you know trying to basically trying to multitask and that was complicated and they thought oh I wish I could get his attention if I only had something that made a bit more noise a bit of an unusual sound 
and the rattle fell out of his pocket. And he thought, ah. Oh. So he picked it up and started rattling. And his colleague looked over, started laughing, and uh, came over and helped him out. And maybe that's how rattles got into the the police system. I'm sure police used to have whistles when I was young. Pretty sure they did. Well, maybe not. But... Uh, That's definitely a bit of trivia to remember. See, that's a bit of trivia. Now, the next bit is a bit of the most pointless information. It, I mean, it doesn't even go together. It's, so they're talking about Trevor Bayliss who is the inventor of the clockwork radio which is an amazing thing isn't it you, to be able to I think it's one that you wind up and it's been used in uh, all over the world places where there's no electricity and such like but they're not focusing on the clockwork radio on what a brilliant invention it was and how it kept people in contact and uh, being able to listen to a human voice wherever they were in the world without needing to kind of pay or be connected or have batteries or anything like that. They're not focusing on that. What they're focusing on and is that he once performed with the Berlin State Circus and also worked as an underwater stuntman. Uh, I don't know don't know what they were thinking with that one uh. <laughs> so I just found another funny one the first electric toaster was produced by Crompton and Company in 1893 Unfortunately, it could only toast one side of the bread at a time. <laughs> Brilliant. Moreover, electric power was not yet wildly available, and then often only at night, as households used electricity almost exclusively for lighting. Consequently, Consequently, the toaster was not a success. Eventually it was, wasn't it? But the thing is, I my toaster broke. That was my bottle there. My toaster broke. I don't know if it was to do with the, the plug that it plugs into, the whatever, but and I've lost two toasters this way where I would turn it on and it would short circuit the whole flat. So I just got rid of it. And I've not replaced it yet. So if I want toast, I need to do it under the grill in the oven. And that is, you know, toasting one side at a time. And I, I, I admit that that story isn't going to win any prizes. But it is relevant to the, to the st story I was talking about, the electric toaster. So it kind of fits in. What other things? Yeah. 
you know the fax machine predates the telephone it was devised and patented by Scottish clockmaker Alexander Bain in 1843 wow that explains why they were so horrible to use Never liked fax machines. Oh, I didn't know this. Alexander Graham Bell, inventor of the telephone, beat rival inventor Alicia Gray to the patent office by just two hours on the 7th of March, 1876. <laughs> oh. So here's one. Oh, I should have crossed these off as I'm reading it, so I never have to mention, <laughs> never have to mention them again, ever, 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 ever. London office worker Mercedes Gleitz proved the reliability of the world's first waterproof watch by wearing one on his wrist while he swam the English Channel in 1927. Oh. That's uh, it could have just stuck it in the bath. Surely. Oh, this is brilliant. I love this. Robert Yeats, or Yates, invented the can opener in 1855. 45 years after British merchant Peter Durand transformed food preservation with his 1810 patenting of the tin can. So they had tin cans for 45 years without a can opener. It says here, until then, people used a hammer and a chisel to open cans. I think we've all been there. Oh, wow, this is another bit. You're never gonna, you'll never read this or s hear about this anywhere else. The inventor of the lava lamp, Craven Walker, also produced Travelling Light, the first naturist film to go on general release in Britain. That's a kind of... Yeah. So here's a question. Do you know what the first Morse code message ever was sent? And 
that was in 1938 by Samuel Morse. He sent a Morse code reading, A patient waiter is no loser. Is it that um, the first re record, audio recording, was like Mary had a little lamb or something, wasn't it? Now this is interesting to me. Um, the first person to set up a mail order business was Price Price Jones. I think they might have made a mistake. I think it would have been called Price Price Jones, maybe, of Newtown in Wales, who began selling local Welsh flannels this way during the 1870s flannels people would choose what they wanted from leaflets he sent out and the goods would then be dispatched by post and train by 1880, he had more than 100,000 customers. That's a rich, but he, oh yes, a man, he had more than 100,000 customers. And that's before the internet, a few years before as well. I mean, to have a hundred thousand customers for any business would be, you'd be rich, wouldn't you? I used to think about doing mail order businesses whence I was a youngster. I was sort of 16, 17, and I used to buy I used to buy a magazine, I used to buy various magazines, but I used to buy a particular magazine called Exchange and Mart. And it was, it was, a large section of it was selling cars, buying and selling cars. But it also had lots of other things to buy and sell, as well as a big business section um, business opportunities and I used to send off for free information so I'd I'd rip out the piece of paper because quite often it'd be a a form a bit like you know when you go online do you know the internet or there's these things like websites you can go on to and they can have like a contact box which is a form that you fill in you, you, you can't literally fill it in with your pen um, well I suppose in some ways you could if you've got that kind of tablet and you type in your name maybe your email, well, definitely your email address, and the message, whatever it might be, and you, you click send, and it sends it to the, uh, the owner of the website. But what it had here in the Exchange and Mart would be a form that you could fill in so you cut it out of the paper or the magazine fill in your name, address and stuff like that and then just send it in the post 
and sometimes it was free post sometimes it was it wasn't but then they would and it's all these different business opportunities and they'd send information in the post like lots of different uh, packages and and it's amazing you know the things that I used to get through things that uh, I could sell catalogues of things that I could sell to other people uh, like jewellery and things like that and there was one that I got which was perfume and I got this big perfume box with I don't know it must have been like 40 40 different little perfume bottles which I was going to try and sell you know the perfume so they'd they'd like the smell of it and then I'd order them a you know a proper bottle size and make profit off of that I was really into jewellery was one that I was into I did sell a bit of jewellery and I went to London and bought some jewellery but it was silver because I couldn't afford to buy any gold so I bought some silver jewellery from Hatton Garden which was the main place for jewellery and I bought all these I didn't buy a lot but I bought I don't know maybe a hundred pounds worth of jewellery rings basically and I I remember travelling back on the train and just walking up to people randomly on the train and trying to trying to sell my jewellery to them which was a bit although it's kind of weird it's a weird thing to do there was something really kind of in exciting about it sort of living living that kind of lifestyle although it was only a train journey it wasn't really a lifestyle but just seeing what that could be like because I was a bit of a a wheeler dealer for a, for a while you know, selling things and buying and selling and you know that kind of stuff and I think if I'd have stuck at it I think I'd have done alright actually because I did have an entre entrepreneurial spirit about me but then I stopped so hey I think I've still got that. I think I've still got that. Actually, I don't think so. I know so. I've still got that part of me that is... Yeah, still that part of me that wants to be successful. You know, really successful. And I'm doing well as far as the amount of people that listen to me every day. That's growing. But you know, it's, I do wonder. I could have been, I could have been a millionaire. Ah, it's still time. It's still time. As long as I've got gas, 
get out of my book, gas in me. I'll be fine. Did you know this? Frank Hornby, who patented Meccano, was originally going to call it Mechanics Made Easy. Now, Hornby, didn't he make the trains? Like the little trains. So here's one. Isn't it weird? Some of these inventions, so this is, oh that was what it was under. So this, this bit is uh, about royalty. I'm gonna leave you on this one. Oh, two actually. Apparently Anne Boleyn had six fingers on her left hand. And William the Conqueror ordered that everyone, everyone, she go to bed at eight o'clock. Now that's someone with control issues. I didn't know this. Queen Victoria was just eight years old when she became queen. Eight years old. I will leave you on this one. This is quite a nice little story. At the age of 14, Prince William, our Prince William of today, was one of the top 100 fastest swimmers in the country. Wow, that lovely. And that's it. <laughs> so thank you very much for listening. I'll speak to you very soon. Remember to be kind to yourself. Because you deserve to be happy. Lots of love.